Hey, hello, is anybody there? Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Is anybody out there, out there? Can anybody hear me? I sure hope so. Anyway. Mm. <laughs> anyway. To the, to the podcast that we uh, are trying to do for the last... I'm sick, in case nobody could tell. So I'm definitely going <laughs> to cough like a bajillion times. Mostly because I don't have medicine. <laughs> Excuse me, I have, like, expired Dayquil pills, and that's about it. <laughs> this is what happens when millennials get sick and their mothers aren't around. This is what happens when millennials get sick, and I use all of my cold drugs in the States and didn't bring any with me here. Why don't you just go to the pharmacy, then? Well, I was going to go today, but I was sick, and I didn't feel like going any farther than <laughs> Starbucks. <laughs> so you got coffee instead of cold medicine. Well, I was like, I can go get coffee and I can go get cold medicine because the coffee was first, like, in the line, like, to get, like... Uh-huh, yeah. The bus the bus route, the coffee shop came up first, so I was going to go get medicine after that. But after I got coffee, I was like, I'm too tired to go any further. Wow. Yeah, like, I took a two hour I took a two hour nap today too. Like my body is just like oh this is the first time we've been sick in like two years, dude, so we're gonna we're gonna oh. die now. As you know, it's um, beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I don't care if this comes out in January. I told you. Every day is Christmas to Little Christmas. But welcome back. Wait. <laughs> wow, that was a lot. our podcast called Dinner and a Murder. I almost said, and that's why we drink. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Em and Christine would appreciate that. I'm, I'm Em. You're obviously Christine. Not Clearly. because Em and I are both queer, but because you're the one married. I don't have a dog but yet, though. I need to work on that. I know, my God. Anyway. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I coughed right into the microphone. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. Did I make it past the little red bar? Anyway, <laughs> welcome back to Dinner and a Murder. We're your hosts. I'm Rose. And I'm Chelsea. And this is our mess of a podcast. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. <laughs> I'm sick, so I'm, like, delirious. I don't know what's happening. Um, oh, it fun. Be... <laughs> this will be really it interesting, be then. This will be great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just just a reminder, send us your stories to our email at dinner and a murder. It's pod, right? Yes, dinner and a murder pod, pod at gmail.com. Gmail and the stories she's referring to are your personal paranormal and true crime stories that you may have from your hometown or from your childhood, anything like that. We want to hear about it and we want to be able to talk about it. So send those in to us. You can also send us your like local urban myths, or I am a fan of creepy pastas. So if you have a short uh, little creepy pasta or. I don't know. You want to tell us some creepy ass story that you had of sleep paralysis? Don't please. That actually scares me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and send them. Uh, try to give yourself like a little title. Yeah. So it kind of sticks out to us. And yeah. Give us All your right. name so we can uh, give you some credit too. some people be sending stuff with no name on it. Um. It's not like we're a teacher. We're not going to mark off credit if you don't give your name. No, I mean, like, if you want, like, a little baby shout out, be like, oh, this story is sent by Julia P or whatever. Uh -huh. you know, have your little name. Your little name was a little shout out. I don't, I don't know. Name. If you want. Oh, goodness. If you want a little baby shout out. You want a beep beep shout out. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, my. Hey, Chels. Hey, Rose. Do you want. To know what I ate this week. I, I would love to know what you ate this week. Good, because I've been waiting for this. Oh, man. This has been on the list for a long time. You've been so excited about this one. I have been here three times. Um, so Good God. 
And I know we said we would try to stay away from chains, but dude, if you're not from this country, from the UK, then it's a new experience for you anyway. So I went to BrewDog, and right. I specifically went to the BrewDog Outpost location in Manchester. Manchester. So it's a little smaller than the uh, bigger one out in the center city. Just like a little smaller. It's not like crazy small. It's a brewery. And they even offer like little tours and stuff of the brewery, brewing, I don't know, brewing process, I guess. The brewery, I don't know, they yeah. Were, they were looking at like the tanks and stuff. There was people there. And I was like, what are they doing? I want to see. And <laughs> <laughs> I want to see. I want to know. <laughs> the whole feel is kind of like this hipster industrial uh, like with exposed brick and those like old timey light bulbs where you can see the the filaments inside of them. Yeah, the old filament and bulbs. Yeah, it's a little industrial construction kind of because you can see like exposed rebar on the ceilings and stuff. Yeah, so I feel like most of the places we've been going to are all the same atmosphere, but that's just like in right now. Yeah. That's true. Well, here's the thing is that Manchester is like the Portland, Vancouver of the U- of the UK. So oh, we're basically wow. in the same place. <laughs> this all is right. like, remember when like Nirvana and all of them were like coming out? And I know they're from like Seattle, I think. Uh, but like that grungy like 90s music was coming from like the area, like the Seattle yeah, to Vancouver, like the Portland Pacific areas. Northwest. Yeah, but specifically up like in Oregon and Washington, um, they also had, like, their, like, UK version of that here. Um, so Manchester, Manchester is, like, the Seattle, Portland, Vancouver (laughs) of the UK. So we're basically in the same place. Uh, Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Um, So BrewDog's a Scottish chain bar that specializes in craft beers. Has a very like relaxed, casual, kind of edgy vibe to it. Very easygoing. The staff are friendly and knowledgeable about the beers. Uh, Always it's good. dog friendly. Oh, like that's the best place. part. Like every other place, but I have to mention it. Shout out to the doggies, the doggos. Yes. Um, I'm waiting for the day somebody brings a cat on their leash and I'm like, yes. Um, that would be hilarious. <laughs> They serve a killer brunch, which I've had, and they also have vegan and vegetarian options. Nice. Uh, They have a couple of locations in the U.S. and in Germany. Unfortunately, the locations in the U.S. are, like, in Ohio, so trust me. Why Ohio? Which kind of sucks, because you would would think it would be, like, in Portland, this kind of place. Who wants to go to Ohio? So, to get to what I had, I had... What they call Jet Black Heart, which was a nitro vanilla milk stout, um, of course. Um, <laughs> of course, it's you. And what they call a Cluck Norris, which was a buttermilk fried chicken sandwich with Cajun mayo, coriander, which is just um, cilantro. <laughs> this is a different part of the cilantro <laughs> thing. I was like, I forgot the word for it. Um, and it typically comes with red onion and avocado, but I don't like red onion and avocado. So I mean, I would love the avocado, <laughs> but yeah, keep the red onion away from me. Yes, I added a uh, cheddar ch- cheater chaz to it. Just, just, um, just. <laughs> cheddar <laughs> cheese to it, cheater chaz, just, and just, it's just. all on a sesame seed, sesame and poppy seed. Brioche bun? Is that how you say that? Yes. Or oh, it's the best bun. It's brioche. <laughs> brioche. <laughs> wow. Um, and then it came with fries and or chips, as they call it here. And I ordered mac and cheese. That sounds so, so good. It was. So the oh food was very, was very, very good. It had two chicken, fried chicken fillets on this, on this monster of a sandwich. Oh my um, God. Yeah. I ended up having to take like half of a fillet off because I was just like, it's too much food. I'm not going to make it. That's um, so much. The mac and cheese was very garlicky and well, like in a good way, not a bad way. I was about um, to say, <laughs> why would there be garlic in mac and cheese? I put garlic in my mac and cheese. Um, and I had like little crumb, like uh, 
the onions that are like crispy on top. Onion straws. Like the little, not the straws, but like crumbled. I guess like you would say onion straws, but like crumbled up. So usually I don't like crusties on my, my mac and cheese, but it wasn't too bad. The Cajun mayo was pretty adequately spicy. Like not <laughs> adequately so spicy. That, it's not so much that like you're crying but enough where you're like, it's got a little kick to it, like a Just little a little bite, a little Chuck Norris kick to it, which I assume is why they call it the Cluck Norris. I mean, I would assume um, so. <laughs> the chicken was juicy and very well done. And the breading was just very good. It wasn't soggy or overcooked or anything like that. So it was all around. The chicken sandwich was amazing. And the fries always amazing. You can't really mess that up. Um, I they were like beg the, to differ. You can definitely like, mess up fries. I mean, I guess, but they were like thick, long, thick, long boys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like the steak fries, but like longer. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the slanty boys. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Um, like I said, the Jet Black Heart was a stout. It was very hoppy and had like a roasted flavor, very dense but smooth. It's a, like I said, it's a nitro vanilla milk stout. So it had like a sweet undertone to it. And it's supposed to be their Guinness equivalent. So naturally, of course, I would gravitate towards it. But. I also, I tasted another stout. So they have like a, a bar, uh-huh. like, um, like you did back at, uh, the growler, that long row uh, of okay. taps. What's uh-huh. that called? That is called a growler station. So and they I'm- had like a growler station <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> it was just like a bunch of their beers on tap. And I told her, I like, I told the late, the worker lady that I like stouts and, um, so she had me try the, the Jet Black Heart and another one called All Roads Lead North. And Ooh. oh my God, it was delicious. It was <laughs> very, very dark, smooth. It's a Tonka bean coffee and vanilla milk stout. So Ooh. it was like a beautiful stout espresso. <laughs> mm. It was sweet and very tasty. And I just thought, the only reason why I didn't get it was I thought it was going to clash with the uh, like the Cajun mayo and the fried chicken. So I was like, keep that in mind, Rose, so that <laughs> I mean, I feel that. like I feel like stouts <laughs> in general just don't go with savory food. Stouts are like dessert beers, in my opinion. I mean, I guess. But I got the Jet Black Heart and I probably will get the All Roads Lead North the next time I go. Maybe for brunch. I mean, mm. not in the morning. <laughs> and that was... Well, I mean, it's brunch. You're meant to be drinking at brunch. <laughs> it's it's brunch, so I don't like mimosas, so I might as well have stout. Exactly. Um, just my mother would be so proud. Um, and that was <laughs> BrewDog. If you're in the area and you have never tried it, I mean, you can look it up. It's all over the UK. So if you're anywhere in the UK, look up and see if there's one near you and go try it out. If you hadn't, try all their beers because I'm sure they're all fantastic. Yep. And that's sweet. All. That's awesome. And uh, that's all I had. I that's forgot. That's all you got? And that's the way the cookie crumbles. That's what the saying <laughs> I was trying to think. <laughs> all right, Bruce. <laughs> Like, oh, what, God. What, what's the say? <laughs> and that's the way the cookie crumbles. I struggled so much with that. Oh, God. Well, now that Rose has her footing again, please like and follow our Facebook page <laughs> at D A A M Podcast, our Twitter. Damn. Our Twitter at D A A M Pod, and Damn. our. <laughs> for fuck's sake, Rose. <laughs> I'm sorry. And our Instagram at dinner and a murder. Whew, all right. Dinner Are you done now? Are you good? I'm good. Okay. You know I did the things. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. <Whew. laughs> so, Chelsea. Rose. You have a you have a story for me? I have I do. I have a story. Ooh, I I'm have excited. For you, the story of Georgia Tan, the child thief. Ooh. Yes. So let's jump right into it. Beulah George Tan, 
affectionately called Georgia by her parents, was born... Um, yeah, I would not mm. want Beulah to be my name. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. Her, her parents was, are already yes. setting her up for failure in life. <laughs> she was born on July 18th, 1891 to parents George Clark Tan and Beulah Yates. Oh, I see where they got so, her name. Um, her, not very creative, these two. They, they did what they could. Ah, uh, well... <laughs> Well, John Bonet Ramsey. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, two in a row here with the creative naming of children. <laughs> with the creative names. Oh, man. Anyway, Tan's father was a judge. He is reported to have been a, quote, domineering personality towards his family. Ooh, that sounds abusive, but okay. Yeah. It, domineering was specifically in quotes. So I was like, hmm, was he, though? Is that the word he wanted to use? <laughs> <laughs> Judge Tan wanted his daughter to become a concert pianist and forced her to take lessons from the age of five well into adulthood. Ooh. Yeah, right? Tan attended Martha Washington College in Abingdon, Virginia, graduating with a degree in music in 1913, even though she hated playing the piano. If I was forced to play an instrument, I'd probably hate it, too. Yeah, well, that's very clearly how she felt. She also... As, as I tell my mom all the time, you should have forced me to play an instrument, mom. Right. <laughs> Tan also took courses in social work at Columbia University in New York for two summers. Ooh. Tan wanted to quit playing piano and become a lawyer. Her father Ooh. tutored... Yeah, well... I'm sorry. This, this girl is like, I'm... She's a... Well, she went well, to Columbia, I'm sorry. Just you, you keep getting excited, but her life sucks, so just stand by. I know her life sucks, but, like, I'm sorry. Keep going. Okay, thank she you. She probably murdered children. Thank but. you for your permission. She did. We'll get to that. <laughs> Tan wanted to quit playing piano and become a lawyer. Her father tutored her in law, and she even passed the Mississippi bar exam. But her father did not actually want her practicing law because she was a woman. Of fucking course. Naturally. What's the point in tutoring her and getting her all the way to the bar exam if you won't even let her practice? Uh, I don't want to, I don't even know what to say. Exactly. Like, her because father tutored her. capable. Apparently. <sighs> anyway. So, according to her father, she was not allowed to practice law, and with nothing else to do, Tan decided to become a social worker. Oh, which, which is, interesting. you know, just the kind of job that you want to be in as a last resort, right? Of course, as a social worker, before I came to school, that's exactly the job you want to be as a last resort. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> says, she says with sarcasm. <sighs> Tan began working as the receiving director at the Kate McWillie Powers Receiving Home for Children in Mississippi. That was a mouthful. Hmm. It was. While working there, she met Anne Atwood, who worked as a house mother there. Sometime during their shared time of employment at the home, they began quietly dating. Oh, gay. gay. I love it. The Too bad. Le lesbian love story. Too bad she's awful. Oh, <sighs> giving, us, giving us queers a bad name. Mm -mm -mm. Also during this time, in 1922, Tan adopted an infant from the home and named her June. Aww. That's all we know about her daughter. That There's Aww. no more information about her. Okay, let's get into... <laughs> The crimes. While working at the Kate McQuilly Powers Receiving Home for Children, Tan was reportedly involved in, quote, questionable child placing methods, unquote, and she was fired mm. in 1924. She moved to Memphis, Tennessee with her daughter June, Ann Atwood, and Ann's infant son Jack, who was born out of wedlock. Mm hmm. Yep, 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 yep. Their quote-unquote Boston marriage, which is the cohabitation of two financially independent women, was viewed as, quote, suspiciously homosexual. Shocker. <laughs> Just suspiciously. Just <laughs> suspiciously homosexual. Boston marriages before this time were viewed as totally socially acceptable because, I mean, two unmarried women have to support themselves somehow, so why not live together and make it easier? But at yeah. this point... In time, people were starting to grow suspicious of two women living together alone. There were already rumors mm -hmm. going around that they were gay. How dare they? 
how dare they? But they did hide the true nature of their relationship, even though they were living together with their children. Oh. In Memphis. Sucks. Uh, yes, it does. But I don't feel bad for her. In Memphis, Tan worked as the executive secretary at the Shelby County branch of the Tennessee Children's Home Society. Apparently, no one actually called past employers for references in these days. No. Nah. Nah. Tan used aggressive tactics to take over the organization. Good old hostile takeover. That's the way you do it. That's the way. In 1924, she began trafficking children. No. Under Tennessee law, adoption agencies could only charge prospective parents for their administrative services to prevent selling children. Before Tan took over, the organization only charged $7 for adoptions in state, which included the legal fees to go to court and uh, formally adopt the child and administrative paperwork, stuff like that. $7. What year was this, Ned? Uh, 1924 is when Georgia Tan took over the organization. Okay, sorry, I just missed the the date, sorry. So, this is the 20s. Mm. When Tan took over, she started bringing in prospective parents from out of state, mostly New York and California, and charging them Mm. a premium for her services. Oh my god. Every three weeks or so, four to six babies were transported to each state for adoption. The prospective parents would meet the caretaker at a hotel to see the child and were charged $700 to be given as a check addressed to Georgia Tan. Jesus. Yeah. So they weren't even addressing these checks to the agency. (laughs) They were addressing them directly to Georgia Tan. If that's not a red flag, I don't know what it is. That's not suspect at all. No, not at all. She would also charge the parents for background checks that she never actually pursued, travel costs Mm -hmm. to transport the child and caretaker, and adoption paperwork at five times the actual cost. Jesus. Records indicate that between 1940 and 1950, brace yourself, over 3,000 children were adopted in those two states alone. Oh my god. 3,000 children by one adoption agency. Not even that. One branch of one adoption agency. And everybody was like, that's normal. (laughs) Totally normal, right? Now, I know you you may be thinking, adoptions cost more than that now. There's nothing wrong with that. And she's placing needy kids with good families. No. No, no, no. It gets worse. Of course. It's alleged that Tan pocketed 80 to 90 percent of the profits from these out-of-state adoptions. Jesus. She also did not report the additional income to the Tennessee Children's Home Society or the IRS. Hmm, tax rod. Of course. Even celebrities used the agencies to adopt their children. Some of the more famous among them are Joan Crawford, who adopted twin daughters Kathy and Cynthia through Tan's services, Aww. and June Allison and Dick Powell. I didn't recognize the names, but I looked them up, and they were both two uh, very famous actors and singers through the 40s and 50s. And yeah, they... I recognize Dick's Powell's name. Yeah, Dick Powell, uh, he, was, he was a pretty big, famous actor. Uh, he and his wife adopted their first child through Georgia Tan. When the normal, quote-unquote, stock of adoptable children proved not to be enough for Tan, she started stealing children. Oh, my God. Mm, This is where I really got mad about this. She coerced young single mothers to give up wanted children. She arranged for the taking of children from mental institution patients and those born to wards of the state. So by that, it means... Children who are, like, in the adoption or foster system well into their teens, so young teens that had children that were wards of the state, those children were also taken. (sighs) She began kidnapping children of single parents when the children were dropped off at nursery school. The parents would come back to pick up their children at the end of the day and be told by the nursery school teachers that welfare had come and taken the child, never to be seen again. Children. It's awful. Children that were placed temporarily in an orphanage because of their parents' inability to care for them would be adopted out without the parents' consent. Often the parents would come back once they had the means to care for the child again, only to be told that the child had been adopted and there was nothing to be done about it, or that there was no record of the child ever having been there at all. So, like, 
parents that got sick or, you know, lost their jobs, couldn't take care of their kids, they would drop their kids off at the orphanage saying, we don't forego our rights as their parents. We're still their parents and we're going to come come back for them. And then they were adopted out anyway. Yeah. What the? Oh, my God. Yeah. She would also take the children of unwed mothers at birth. Claiming that the child needed medical attention, she would leave with it and adopt it out to another family. When the mother asked where her baby had been taken, she was told that the child had died. What the hell? Mm-hmm. Tan destroyed records of the children that passed through the agency. She conducted little, if any, background checks on prospective parents. Because of this, the Child Welfare League of America dropped the agency from its list of qualifying institutions in 1941. I have the notice that the Child Welfare League of America released Mm -hmm. as a statement that they were dropping this organization from their list. And there are so many points, like reasons that they were dropped from the list. It's insane. Tan falsified background documents on the children to hide the circumstances of the child coming to the agency. If prospective parents discovered the documents to be false, she would threaten them with legal action to declare them unfit parents and have their children taken from them. This was often enough deterrent for the parents to drop the matter and stay quiet. Tan's accomplices included one Memphis family court judge, Camille Kelly. Tan would identify families she believed were unfit to care for their children, and the judge would rush the case through her dockets, often resulting in the seizure of the children involved and custody granted to the Tennessee Children's Home Society. This really pisses me off, too. In cases of child custody after divorce, Kelly often ruled that neither parent was fit for custody and would place those children with Tan's agency, who then arranged for the adoption of the children into Quote, homes better able to provide for the child's care, unquote. Mm. So parents that were going to court, honestly, just for custody after divorce, had their children taken away from them. It's ridiculous. Just because of the divorce. Though more often than not, the children were placed with families that used them as child labor on farms or with abusive families. Of course. Of course. (laughs) To avoid any suspicion from county officials, Tan would arrange for the adoption hearings to take place in other Tennessee county courts. I don't see how, like, nobody was, this was going under the radar. Right? This went on for, like, almost 20 years. Uh, Like, people, there's other people involved. Like, she's not taking care of all of these kids by herself. No, there's a lot (sighs) of people involved in this, and they have to know what she's doing. And I know, like, there's not, like interagency communication at this time they didn't even get that until like the 90s and we're still working on it right now in the u.s so i understand that but like like i said there's still people at the freaking homes and orphanages and stuff taking care of these kids and they're not sitting there like hmm there's an overwhelming amount of children here and she's like adopting them out like they're hot cakes like nobody's suspicious oh well i'm pretty sure she also I mean, nothing specifically said this, but I'm pretty sure based on, you know, how things are worded and context clues that she probably replaced the original staff with people loyal to her. Mm. Um, the The staff also grew while she was in charge because of the need for child care. But mm. as we'll learn so in a second. So she was like creating jobs, uh, I guess, to I mean, the outside I, world. I guess you could say that. It's a terrible thing to do, though. Yeah. The children that Tan seized and kidnapped weren't placed immediately with adoptive parents. They all passed through the public facilities and foster homes before being placed. The Tennessee's Children's Home Society didn't have its own housing facility. They didn't have an orphanage or anything. So Tan Tan just found somewhere to put them until they could be adopted. That's always the best thing to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Tan mistreated all of the children that passed through her care. There were reports of neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and murder. My God. In the 1930s, Memphis had the highest infant mortality rate in the nation, largely due to Georgia Tan. Wow. Uh Uh-huh. 
Hal's gonna be like, cause all that lead. <laughs> uh, I can't. Uh. I just can't. In 1943, a wealthy businessman donated the mansion at 1556 Poplar Avenue to the society. The offices and intake rooms were put on the bottom floor, while the nurseries were upstairs. The all-female staff wore white nursing uniforms, despite the fact that they were mostly untrained and even substance abusers. Nice. Yeah. The children were frequently sedated, and those who were difficult to place were allowed to die of malnutrition. No! literally just neglected and left to die if they couldn't be adopted i don't like this tan regularly ignored doctors recommendations for sick children denying them care or medicine which often led to Mm. preventable deaths from illnesses like diarrhea (gasps) oh no yeah these poor babies while some of her victims are known to be buried in elmwood cemetery in memphis tennessee other children were never accounted for and the exact number of children killed by neglect remains unknown, with estimates of about 500 deaths due to mistreatment. Oh my goodness, the poor babies. I know, the poor babies. So, finally, right around 1950, officials caught wind of what was going on here. Finally. The Tennessee governor of the time, Gordon Browning, launched an investigation into the society on September 11, 1950, after receiving reports that the agency was selling children for profit. Hmm. He assigned Memphis attorney Robert Taylor to the case. Public Welfare Commissioner J.O. McMahon accused Tan and her cohorts of receiving as much as one million dollars in profits. Jesus. Yeah. The Tennessee Children's Home Society was permanently closed in December 1950. Oh my God. It is estimated that Tan stole over 5,000 children. Oh my God. Yeah. Stole them from their families, from people that loved them and wanted them and were looking for them. The states of New York and California, where Tan placed most of the children, vowed to take action, but an investigation was never opened. None of those children were ever restored to their families. (sighs) (sighs) Want to hear some shit? Sure. Tan died of cancer on September 15th, 1950, just three days before charges were brought against the Tennessee Children's Home Society. So she was never brought to justice. What a bitch. Bitch had the audacity to die. The audacity. The audacity. Not up in here. Not up in here. No. <laughs> Over the course of her tyrannical quote unquote career, 19 of the children that died in her care were buried in a small plot that she owned in Elmwood Cemetery in Memphis. They were not marked by gravestones and only referred to by first names in records, like Baby Johnny, Baby Ellie, things like that. Oh, my God. In 2015, the cemetery raised $13,000 to erect a monument on the plot in the children's memory. (sighs) So, that is all I've got on the terrible case of the child thief, Georgia Tan. Well, you picked a fun one, Chelsea. Didn't I? Good God. So, So, I guess she's not technically a serial killer. She's (sighs) just like... Not technically a serial killer. It's like a killing for profit kind of thing. Yes. She was a child trafficker, uh, adoption. Yeah. She was, you know, guilty of adoption fraud and all that good stuff. So because of the sheer number of children that were victims of her, she is the subject of a lot of, of mass media and lots of movies about her. One of which, one movie about her, is called Missing Children, A Mother's Story, which was a TV film released on December 1st, 1982. It starred Mayor Winningham, Polly Holiday, and John Anderson. It has a 7.5 out of 10 on IMDb. It was inspired by the Georgia Tan case, but otherwise very loosely based on the case. Oh, okay. It's, it doesn't actually feature a character named Georgia Tan. It's just events that kind of 
mirror the case, but not directly from it. I see. Next, there was Stolen Babies, which was also a TV film. It was released on March 25th, 1993 on Lifetime. It starred Leah Thompson, Kathleen Quinlan, and Mary Tyler Moore as Georgia Tan. Hmm. It has a 6.3 out of 10 on IMDb. This one is directly based on the case. It features Georgia Tan, of course, and her organization, but the main character, played by Leah Thompson, is fictional, and the story that surrounds her is also fictional. So a little bit of fact, a little bit of fiction all mixed into this movie. I mean, it's yeah, life. maybe they just, like, mixed, like, a common story into one person kind of thing, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a Lifetime movie, so they had to take dramatic liberties. You got it if you want to be on Lifetime. Got to. Lifetime has to be dramatic. Not that this story this wasn't, wasn't dramatic, dramatic on its own, but... <laughs> uh, then... Um, actually, backtracking a little bit, in 1989, Unsolved Mysteries did an episode featuring her case. It One was it was released on December 13th, 1989, and the host of the show at the time was Robert Stack. It told the story of a single father, a widower, whose wife had died in childbirth, and his Ooh. child was taken by Georgia Tan. And he was searching for his long-lost daughter 50 years later. Oh, my God. It was so sad. I mean, he told the story of how, you know, he and his wife were poor, but they were in love. And they were so excited to welcome their child. And then his wife survived for about an hour after childbirth. And then she just suddenly passed away. And he never knew why. And then, of course, Georgia Tan caught wind that he was a single father with a baby, and she came along and stole it. What a bitch. What a bitch. Um, and I'm not sure if he ever found his daughter. I really, really hope so, though. I don't know. That's so <sighs> sad. Yeah, it was... It's... Everything about this case is heartbreaking. I mean, the, num the sheer number of families that she destroyed, it it's incalculable. It's insane. Next, Deadly Women on Investigation Discovery did an episode called Ooh. Above the Law. It aired on September 13th, 2013, and has an 8.5 out of 10 on IMDb. I because have, it's a good-ass fucking show. It's an Sorry. amazing <laughs> show. I love it. I have anything not... On, on, anything on ID is amazing. <laughs> ID is the reason why I don't have Sky TV. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be sitting there watching it. Oh, man. I have not had the pleasure of seeing this episode of Deadly Women, but I hope to soon because it's an amazing show. I feel like Wives, and, <sighs> wives with Knives. That's the shit right there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do TV. <laughs> Sponsor us. Oh, my God. Uh, Georgia Tan has frequently been the subject of podcast episodes like this one for as long as podcasts have been around wait this is a podcast no I'm kidding <laughs> whoa i mean if there's a true crime podcast out there odds are they've done an episode on georgia tan in 2007 barbara zance raymond i hope i said that right released a book called The Baby Thief, The Untold Story of Georgia Tan, The Baby Seller Who Corrupted Adoption. The Whew. babies. Long title, but it has a three and a half out of five on Goodreads and 4.3 mm. out of five from Barnes & Noble. So seems like mm. a pretty good book. And that is all I've got on The Child Thief, Georgia Tan. I'm pretty surprised that Georgia Tan isn't the inspiration for Miss Hannigan from Annie because Miss Hannigan was a truly evil house mother for the orphanage that Annie lived in. And it reminds me an awful lot of Georgia Tan. So tomorrow, tomorrow. What? You've never seen the musical, but you can sing tomorrow? Um, yeah, I've never seen what is the movie called? <laughs> The Sound of Music, but I know the hills are alive. Well, that's a classic. Sound of... Well, so is Annie. I just haven't seen it. Well, it's good. Okay, so Annie came out in... I feel like 1985. 
the newest one, Jamie Foxx, came out in 2014. The one before that yes. came out in 1982. Ooh, I was so close. Oh, Carol Burnett played Miss Hannigan in the 80s version. Mm. Uh, <laughs> as you were talking and I was listening, I wrote some thoughts down. Oh, um, please share. Okay, share with the class. Okay. Uh, the whole thing where people are basically coerced into giving away their wanted children still happens today. Um, mm-hmm. There was actually like this huge case that, like, that I saw on CNN and I learned about it in my women in crimes class where we learn about like trafficking with children and women. And there are a lot of people internationally where they're like poor or uneducated parents, but they are able to still kind of provide for like not so poor that their children are starving, but, you know, but their parents are uneducated. So they're like these adoption agencies in their countries that are like, oh, well, we're going to take your kid and place them with like an American family or whatever. And they're going to provide for that child and get them like a good education and everything. And the parents are like, yeah. And they end up signing these papers, not realizing that they're signing away their parental rights. Yeah. And that their children are going over to be adopted. Not realizing they're never going to get their children back. Yeah. And by the time they realize what's happened, there's nothing they can do because they've signed away their rights, number one. And number two, they probably have no idea where their children are going or if the government is going to listen to them because sometimes they live in areas where the government doesn't really care about their people. It's, yeah, um, so I've heard of agencies like that, like where the, they take advantage yeah. of undereducated people. And then, the you know, the people in America that are adopting these children think they're doing this really good deed, bringing a child out of poverty and adopting them. And they don't even realize that the child yeah. has a family that wants them back home. Yeah. And by the time, like some I mean, whether or not like American families realize what's going on, maybe some of them don't have the resources to really reconnect. Yeah them because as far as they know all the documentation was legal the parents signed away their rights and they have no real tangible proof that Mm. the parents were coerced so there's nothing really like the adoption agencies say they don't they can't do anything about it i'm sure there is but nobody wants to do anything yeah Um, which leads to like a big another issue where you were saying where the expense of the adoptions are just extremely high and ridiculously high. And I know a lot of people are like, well, if you're going to take care of a kid, you should have a lot of money. But you don't, the amount of money it costs to adopt a child is so astronomical that it could probably make you have no money to take care of the child. Like, you don't need grands and grands of money to take care of a child for like a year. You just need it over time you know yeah like as long as you make a decent income enough to take care of that child month to month or year to year yeah it's fine and I mean I've looked into it too because adoption is how you know we've discussed about growing our family and it costs Mm -hmm. an average of between 10 and 15 grand on the low side Mm -hmm. to adopt a child on the low side on the low side it can cost like four times as that five times as that if yeah. you go to other agencies. It's just a whole mess. Um, and what you were saying about, um, like, taking kids from parents that are deemed incapable of caring for their child kind of reminds me we were talking about Penhurst and there yes. were kids that were sent to Penhurst just because the courts were like, well, the parents are both criminals, so obviously we've got to step in and take custody because yeah. if we don't, then this kid will be a criminal, which... And it's kind of how it works, but also not how that works. <laughs> well, with Penhurst, too, that was extra heartbreaking because a child that becomes a ward of the state like that should go to mm-hmm. an orphanage or a foster home, a group home, something, not a mental institution. Yeah, well, Ugh. it's a whole thing. Anyway, if you enjoyed this episode of Dinner on a Murder, please subscribe and tell your friends to tune in for more information about Georgia Tan, the movies and other media about her, and BrewDog. Check out our website. And like Chelsea said earlier, please like and follow our Facebook page, our Twitter and Instagram for more content. Also, please rate and review us on iTunes and Facebook. It helps so, so, so much to get good reviews.
If you have any questions, comments, corrections, or want to leave a suggestion for us, you can send us a message on Facebook or email us at dinnerandamurderpod at gmail.com. And of course, don't forget to send us your personal true crime and paranormal stories for our monthly segment. If you would like to help us keep our podcast going, please consider joining our Patreon. We have some really cool treats for you if you do join us, like picking our topic do 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 which is coming up soon it is um there's also other ways to support us which you can find out on our website so go check it out all of the links that we've mentioned in this episode are in our link tree in the description please be sure to tune in every thursday for new episodes thursday. thanks for listening ow <laughs> Thanks for listening. I will earplugs out of my, <laughs> my ears, my eyes. No! I will yank my earphones out of my eyes. <laughs> that would have been weird. <laughs> I was doing so good. I messed oh, up. Oh, no. We will see Thanks. you guys next Thursday. Bon appétit. Bon appétit. <laughs> oh, did it.